Hey guys. <coughs> yep, Ben from uh, Blackboard Software, so a little bit about me first. Uh, I built my first computer game when I was nine. I had to throw poos at the, the end boss. Uh, kept building games till I was 15. Came to Auckland Uni, did a degree in um, computer science and a degree in marketing. Uh, started Blackboard Software when I was 24, and uh, that kind of brings me to here. So, what I'm going to talk to you about today is what we do at Blackboard Software, um, the processes and the technologies we use, and how we how we deal with our clients. Um, then I want to kind of dive into how it actually works in the real world. There's a lot of theory, and there's a lot of um, you know, like ideal workflows and technologies to use, but it's hard when there's a client on the other side of it or there's a budget on the other side of it. And then finally, I'm going to uh, give you some extra skills that I find really valuable when I'm employing people or, or working with others. Uh, so let's just jump straight into it. So, uh, Blackboard, we've been around for about 15 years. We build uh, pretty pretty complex sites if you've got your continuum of software, you've got your brochure uh, kind of websites here, over here you've got your super nerdy um, analytics, we're about here, right? So we do a lot of um, big data uh, reporting, we bring in um, information from disparate systems, we convert it, we move it out to zero or we move it out to um, any other API really, that's what we do. There's usually one or more databases behind it, and there's usually a web front end these days, although I can do a mobile if you twist my arm. Um, and typically we use Microsoft Stack. So, <clears throat> first of all, how Blackboard works. I'm going to take you through the, the overarching, uh, I don't know, trends that we've adopted, and, and then we'll go into a bit more detail about exactly how we use it. So I'm going to start with Agile development which is a really uh, popular, um, dare I say, the most popular way of working. I'm not sure. You'll have to excuse me. I don't know if your technical level is really low or really high, so I'm going to try to hit like a midpoint here. Uh, but agile development is all about building a little bit of code, and then talking with the client or the user, getting feedback, then building a little bit more code, and then sending it back out. So you're constantly on this iterative cycle. It works really well. Um, most developers like it because the alternative is to spec up a whole project first and then build it. And that spec is boring and usually once the client starts seeing what you're doing, they change their mind and then you've got to break the spec and what's the point in the first place. So we do Agile. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a sensitive subject for me because it can also be just an excuse for lazy development. It's not it's not to be abused. You, you, can't, you can't just start programming without talking to your client. You can't and then call that agile, right? That's just sloppy. Um, <clears throat> so Blackboard's very agile. There's only five of us. I make sure that all my developers, um, as well as coding, they can talk to the client. The client can phone them up and st talk straight to the dev that's doing their work, which is really um, valuable for everybody concerned. Um, we do a daily stand-up, which is part of like your Scrum methodology, which is part of Agile. It's funny though, I wrote this presentation about a month ago, and in the last couple of weeks I've noticed that our daily stand-ups have actually drifted off a little bit, so we're kind of breaking our rules there. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's hard. Um, <clears throat> and the best thing, and the thing I love about Agile, is that if there's an urgent change, or more likely an urgent um, update a requirement, maybe a client has a new opportunity and they really need to see something really quickly. Um, we've got the systems and the processes in place that we can, we can jump on and code that and have it deployed, sometimes within minutes, um, sometimes within hours or days. So Agile works well for us. Communication. <clears throat> lots of people can do this, lots of developers can program. And you know you've got your front end, your, your web app, you've got a little bit of logic, you've got some databases and stuff. But for me, software development is, is much more than just what you're doing in front of the computer. It's listening to a client's requirements. It's understanding that 
if they want feature X, Y, Z, then that's actually similar to something they said last week. So maybe you could build them at the same time. Or maybe this is really expensive and there's a cheaper way that you can get it to them. And at the other end of that, once you've built the system, there's constant feedback. There's feedback from your client and there's feedback from your client's clients. So I rate communication extremely highly amongst developers. You need to be able to talk uh, geek to human, human to geek. You know, you've got to, you're the person between their idea and the actual manifestation in code. Really important. <coughs> yeah, and uh, we talk our clients out of a lot of work. Um, I think this is really important. A lot of clients are not technical, but they have these grand ideas or they see a cool thing on another website and you have to be circumspect and look about it in the bigger picture. You have to understand that uh, their database might be under stress or it might cost too much money. So you have to be able to um, stand up to your clients and, and yeah, talk them out of work. And I should add that you're not really losing money, you're just moving your money downstream, right? And you're keeping that client because they've got, uh, they've got the funds to keep going and they, they trust you. Tools and automation is another really um, important thing that we do. <clears throat> if we move fast and we have new developers coming in, then the way you can uh, safeguard that and um, standardise it across developers and across clients is to systematise as much as possible. So we use things like um, continuous deployment, continuous integration. Uh, we can type a little bit of code, check it into GitHub, tests will run, they'll fire off to the developer. If there's a problem, they'll fire off to me if there's a big problem. And it's funny, like, that was just a few sentences and it's just a few bullet points on a slide, but we've invested tens of thousands of dollars in getting these systems right. It's really complicated to get systems or DevOps or whatever you want to call it these days. It, it's, for me, about 30% of Black Ball's time is invested in systems and systematizing stuff. It's not necessarily cutting code. <clears throat> uh, yep. Database migration scripts is really hard, by the way. I won't go into it, but I'm quite proud that we can do it now. Okay, so a lot of that was kind of um, high level. And a lot of that you will also find online if you search how to run a software company or how to be an agile developer. And that's what we strive to do. But now I'll tell you about how we really do it. So the minimum viable product is the, my personal um, favourite tool. We get uh, people coming in and they want, um, you know, they, they have this idea and it's their baby and they love it. They want to be the next Facebook, they want to be Facebook, Facebook for dogs. They want to have a, a feed of your favourite food and they want to have, um, you know, your dog can take a selfie and can send it to whatever. <coughs> But that's, it's too much. If you built all of that for them straight away, they would run out of money, it's not in front of their users, and you'd lose that client, they would lose money, and they would lose faith in the whole system. So what we do when we talk to people is we, we listen to their big, big idea, we want to know where they want to go, and then I break it down into three parts. The long term, which is what we just said, then the medium term, and the, and the immediate term. And our goal is to get that immediate, immediate term project or set of functionality out and code as quickly as possible. So the MVP, the minimum viable product, is the minimum set of functionality that they are willing to put in front of their users. It's a really hard thing to train clients on. They feel like this super feature is an absolute essential part of what the product is. And if that's true, then that's fine. We'll go build it. But most of the time, the users don't care. You need to, the only way you can tell is to build it and get it out in front of the users. So we cut it down to the MVP as quickly as possible and we code that and then we jump into our agile methodology and we iterate on it. And then we start getting the medium term features. And the reason we want the medium term and the long term features is because when we build the MVP, the one place where we don't take a shortcut is the architecture of the code. You need to understand where it's going to go and you need to put in the hooks and the plugs 
so you can quickly tap things on later on. <clears throat> right, so death by a thousand features, right? I love that phrase, and it's so true. You, you, I'm sure you've all used systems, and they can do everything, but it's too much, right? It, all it does is complicate the whole system. So you have to be continuously ruthless when you're trimming features out of software, and a really good way to do that is to get it in front of users quickly and get their feedback. And if they're not using it, cut it out. So practically speaking, um, permissions are hard. They take a lot of time. So a good way to MVP is to just, you're either in the system or you're not. You can't, by, by the way I mean they're hard, is uh, you might have access to this page or this page, but you can't do this. So an MVP, if you can log in, you can do everything or not. Um, another really good one is um, administration pages. A lot of what you see as end users, um, consider Facebook for example, you can see your, your feed and you can see kind of your personal settings page, but in the type of systems we build, at least 50% of the work is behind the scenes. It's the admin side where our clients will log in and they might populate um, their user base or they might import some financial figures. So for an MVP, we usually cut that out because the only person that's using it is the client. And they can just send us the information and plug it straight into the database directly. And then later, when they're sick of emailing us their CSVs to import, at that point, we'll build the admin screen. Technical debt. <clears throat> just like a, a, a house loan, Technical debt allows you to, to borrow now to get something now in order that you pay it back later. But just like a regular loan, if you don't pay that debt off quickly, it's going to compound and it's going to get worse and worse. And if you make shortcuts in your architecture at the start, then that technical debt is very, very hard to pull out. So <clears throat> the alternative, though, is no technical debt. And technical debt is a tool. It's a choice that you make, and you prioritise something now, and that something might be to get this feature out in front of a user, but you have to be ruthless about paying it off later. And by paying it off, I simply mean uh, fixing, the, fixing the shortcut that you took. So let me try to think of a practical example. Maybe there's a, um, a, a vehicle entry form, and you have to type in vehicle details, like a make and model and stuff like that. Maybe because you need to get it out now, you decide not to put validation in. You're not checking for duplicate cars, for example, based on the license plate. So you might skip that. If you make a note of it in your bug tracker, ship it, make sure it's all good. But don't leave it in your bug tracker because it's going to get compounded by other bugs and other bugs and other bugs and you're going to lose it. So the only way around this is to be disciplined and to return to that mountain or that, that technical debt loan and just chip away at it every week on a regular basis, Monday morning or something like that. It's easy. Uh, developers don't tend to mind doing it, but clients do because the client thinks that they've got their vehicle management form. But we know that it's shaky and so you have to kind of convince them. Or you don't tell your client and you just do it. So this is something that only um, I really only understood this year. I was talking to um, one of my clients, and <clears throat> I was doing a uh, like a, a review of their architecture because they were selling their business. And he was complaining about the developer that did it, and he thought that he was getting a piece of software, but for him, a piece of software included documentation and testing and deployments and support and backup databases and high performance. But a piece of software is, it, it, it can be any one of those things. We describe it as a piece of software, but we don't necessarily convey to the client what it is. And this is why sometimes you'll get um, two companies quoting for the same piece of software at vastly different prices. So here's some, here's some examples of the things that go go on around the software that the client doesn't necessarily see. And you can come in and you can build just this and they will be happy because they've got the software that they described to you. But actually there's a lot more that goes on 
there's the requirements beforehand, there's kind of padding up the architecture, documentation maybe, and then of course all the support. So Blackball, when we started, we used to do this, and we were quite cheap. We got a lot of work because we were quite cheap, but our hourly rate was quite high. But I've learned that that's a short-term um, view because the inevitability of this is that you end up with a dissatisfied client their system falls over because it's not extensible, or they've got their own internal developers who don't know what they're doing because you haven't documented it. So now, Blackball price is higher, and we don't necessarily go into the, all the detail that we're going to do for them, uh, but we encompass a lot more of this um, throughout, um, you know, in our pricing and in our work. And it's also a bit easier, you know, automated development processes, like I said, that, that costs tens and tens of thousands of dollars for us to set up over years and years. Now we can roll it out to clients at no extra cost. But to, to do that when we were starting out wasn't feasible. You can't pass that cost on to the client. Uh, I just want to quickly touch on developer turnover. Um, I know that you're not hiring developers, but you are a developer, and so I'd like to try to express to you um, <clears throat> the pain of developer turnover and what we're kind of considering when um, you might be being employed. So it's very costly for a business um, for a number of reasons, and these are all probably quite obvious. Something that's kind of technical debt you can deal with, you can document it, this last one, new arts around how a system hangs together, that's tough, you know. A lot of developers, um, they'll do something amazing, but they keep it to themselves, right? We take a lot of pride in our work, but it's, it's enough to just know that you did it. But they don't, haven't necessarily followed a convention or a pattern. And then the next developer that comes in has no idea how this magic is happening. It's really difficult. And client expectations is something that I've only learned recently as well. A client, you know, you might recall earlier, I said our clients call our developers directly, and that's great. They develop a personal relationship with that person, and they get used to the way that person works, get used to the way that person prices. So when they go, you end up with a customer who's a little bit kind of lost, a little bit confused. Now, I don't actually have an answer to any of these things, except for the technical debt one. Um, but it's, I don't know, I just wanted to put it in there. It's important to me. <clears throat> so what we do is systematize as much as possible um, Blackball is a, um, an agency developer, so we have lots of completely different projects going on at any one time for completely different clients. But within that, uh, we can still systematise and keep our code extremely consistent between projects, which means that developers can jump in, uh, sorry, jump between projects and instinctively know where they should be able to find the data access classes, for example, or even what a function should be called or how it should be capitalised, for example. And that is, um, if I could, if I could make them do that, if I could systematise it, that would be great. But a lot of it comes down to convention, which is basically just remembering. You just have to remember to name your variables a certain way. Uh, we use a variety of project management tools like Trello and stuff, but that's kind of still, that's kind of normal. Oh, and um, code comments. I'm obsessed with commenting your code. We use Visual Studio, our codes are green, and our, no, our comments are green, our code is black, and if I look at a developer's screen and it's not a third green, then I go tell them to go back and fix it up. I like big, long, descriptive comments. You know, a bit of history, what they had for breakfast that morning. But it's true though, like, and it's even good, so you got me talking about comments now. I've gone back to code that I wrote and not understood why I did it. And you see a bug there, which you, which you realise is a bug, but it could have been done on purpose. And if only you'd written and said, look, this is a little bit shaky, but whatever, I had sausages for breakfast, so this is why I'm doing this. At least the next person can put it in perspective. It's really important. Cool, wow, well, final section. Um, so, I've touched on communication, but I'd like to re-emphasise it again. Um, I just think that software developers in particular are, um, tend to be quite introverted, and they tend to be 
uh, socially awkward, least, least likely to talk to other people. I'm the same. And so it's hard to kind of instill a communication culture or, or kind of emphasize how important that is. But software doesn't exist in isolation. It needs to interact with the people that pay you and it needs to interact with the people that uses it. So you need to be able to communicate with them. <clears throat> and communication is a two-way street. The number of hours I've lost trying to explain to a client why my particular architecture is cool or why this is 20 milliseconds faster than it was last week. And they don't care. And they don't understand. And it's really hard sometimes to swallow your pride. You build something amazing which you're so proud of and you want to tell people about it or you want, to, you want your client to pay you for it. But they don't care. And the reason I put up a picture of an iPhone here is because I think Apple does this really well. It's an incredibly com complex machine, but it's so simple to use. And they had the, 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 the dignity or whatever you call it to just, just quietly put it out there and, and, and hide all the complexity from you. And that takes a lot of discipline. And I'm still guilty of it all the time. I will still leave like a little, little menu item in the top which says like, live system log feed or something. It's bad. It's bad. So you need to be able to talk to your clients. And equally, you need to listen to your clients and you need to convert what they're saying to what you can do and what your software can do and what you know is baked into their software capabilities. Um, yeah, a really, a really classic example is they say they want a, um, a feed of upcoming events and they want, and then a week later they say, I want to be able to see, I want to have like a diary that I can edit. And you should be able to think, well, that's both just a list of times, one's editable and one's not. So you could merge them into the same function and have like a little flag which said, show the edit icon. And immediately you save them, you know, it's 60% it's of what it would have been to build them both to start. And you've eliminated your, um, the duplication of support issues that you're going to have going forward if you basically copy pasted stuff. <coughs> kind of following on from that and slightly off topic, <coughs> often when you're building software, um, you might have already built that first module and it would be quicker to just copy paste it and build it again and, and tweak it and then deploy it as the second module. It's way better in the long run to just tweak that first module, just update it, refactor it, abstract out the common stuff. And that way you've only got one thing to support. You, your code is quicker to compile. It's, it's just well worth doing. <coughs> oh yeah, and my funny, the funny one is when they say, um, oh, can you just add this button to the bottom of the person management screen, please? and it's, it's, you know, cook them some bacon and eggs or something ridiculous. And for them, it's just a button. But for us, it can be half a dozen database tables and a background task to process hundreds of thousands of millions of records. And it's really, you need to become skilled at conveying to a client <coughs> why something is, is not feasible or why it's, why it's more than what they think it is. Although other times they might have a whole big form, they think it's going to be really expensive and actually you've done it before, so it's only $50. Passion. <clears throat> the best software developers are people that love their craft, you know. I was building games when I was younger. If I had time off, I'm thinking about ways I can improve what I do. I... Uh, read industry newsletters to see what new tech is out there that I can play with. I love my craft. I love doing what I do. And I love my staff to love doing what they do as well. I think a computer programmer that, um, well, not even a computer programmer, just someone who's delivering this service or this product for somebody, if they love what they do, it comes through. Not just manifesting in, in the end result, the work, but how they deal with their clients, how they are proactive with their clients, how they are proud to um, deliver it to them, how they pull a late night 
because they need to get something out uh, in time. Passion. So when I hire people, the way I look for, anyone can say, yeah, I'm passionate about programming. But there are ways that it manifests. You can ask what newsletters they subscribe to. So currently I subscribe to four weekly newsletters. It takes me about an hour a week to scan them all. And I don't read every single article that they link to, but it, it gets in my head and now I understand that, oh, okay, so that database can do X, Y, Z. And maybe in six months, when I hear about X, Y, Z, I know from memory that, yep, okay, that database can do that. So then I go and I look at the article a little bit more. But it's, I cannot overemphasize, I mean, the landscape changes so quickly. If you do one thing, just subscribe to some newsletters. You don't have to read them all. Just, just get it washing over you. Projects in your spare time is amazing. Anyone who um, is willing to devote a weekend to, I don't know, I don't care what the software is or how boring it is or even how badly it's written, the fact they took the time to do it, they're curious to see how it worked, means a lot. And open source projects kind of follows on from that. And that's actually quite good because it shows that they, they can work in a team and uh, they can use some certain tooling and stuff like that. But it can go too far. Programmers have um, strange personal habits, which they sometimes get into. You can, you can spot these people. Um, and I think that someone who is obsessed with software and it's all they do, it's not healthy either. You need... Even, even considering the output of your code, it's going to be impacted by the other things that, that are going on around you. If you've got family and friends or you've got another hobby, these are good things and they're going to make your code better and they're going to make you more fun to work with. So development speed is a... People often ask how much we charge by the hour but I've never been asked how many hours it will take me to build. And we're a service industry and we charge by the hour. So they're the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. And you might get a developer who is a super genius developer and the results are perfect. But if they're taking 10 times as long to build that code, it's not, I can't use them. They might be fine um, in a research position or maybe working for NASA. But in our type of work, I value speed just as much as I value code quality. Code quality will improve. Speed's hard. <clears throat> Even um, when you're working, you know what it's like when you're, you're focused on something. And then um, any distraction or delay is an opportunity for you to kind of snap out of that. Checking your phone or waiting for something to compile, it all... It all adds up and suddenly you haven't just lost the 10 seconds that the interruption took, you've been snapped out of your train of thought and it takes minutes to get back into it. You do that 10 times a day, 50 times a day and it, it adds up. So there are actually some practical things that you can do. And believe it or not, um, learn to type fast, really fast. I can type at 80 words per minute, which is the fastest in my office. I'm not sure if that's as fast as you guys. but. It's good, and it means if I'm writing a note or an email or something, I can quickly knock it out and then move on. I've got other guys who, great developers, very old, but they still type like this, and they can't touch type. And it drives me, it drives me crazy. Um, shortcut keys are absolutely fantastic. Did I write that down? Oh yeah. But you have to practice them, learn your software. We joke in my office, I haven't done it, but I threaten that we'll have mouse-free Fridays where people can only use the keyboard to navigate their computer. I reckon just a month of those and we'd all be superstars. But do practice, look up your shortcut keys, configure them, do what you need to do, really valuable. Um, it's always worth paying extra thousand bucks for a faster computer. And automate. So, the final thing is, um, it's, you know, when I did my ComSci course 20 years ago, um, I had a book, right? The internet was there, but it wasn't so much a resource. But now the internet's all we use. 
and it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, you can find anything you want. You can become an expert at anything you want. But you're also flooded with um, bad code examples and um, bad approaches, incorrect approaches, th or things that aren't right or wrong, but they don't really fit in with how you're used to doing things. So you have to, you have to just uh, learn to read the internet and code as if it's a suggestion it's never a rule it's just people like you and me that um, have the time to upload and you know share their work and that's wonderful I'm not disparaging the intent uh, but you must take it with a grain of salt and it's kind of frustrating if you copy paste code from the net and then a bug manifests in it a few months later you can't kind of say oh it wasn't me that coded it because it kind of was you <laughs> <coughs> Um, yeah. Shivers. Sorry, guys. I'm a little bit early today. Um, that's it. But um, hopefully, you have a few questions. Um, just to reiterate, I love what I do, and I love to talk about it. If you ever want to ask me a question, or I don't know, whatever, please know my email address. You can email me at any time. Um, a lot of what I spoke about today I've summarised in a book and if that's too much for you, you can go to that same link and uh, there's like a 12 week email series which sends you out in kind of digestible amounts. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>